Hello, everyone. Welcome to C-Suite Talks. We speak with industry leaders, introducing you to some of the most interesting people and businesses today. We are focused on women, money, and power, as well as diversity in all areas. Welcome to C-Suite Talks. I'm co-CEO Beth Hilbing with... Hi, I'm co-CEO along with Beth. I'm Diane Gubin. And today we are speaking with Ruth Jin, and she is out of New York. So Ruth is a capital markets lawyer and a leader of investment funds and practice at Moses and Singer, uh, the law firm. And her personal mission, she's an advocate for capital formation and growth, which we love. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you for the introduction. Oh, Happy to be yeah. here. Our pleasure. Thank you for all that you do with us and with the C-Suite community. We truly appreciate that. Uh, we are very interested in you and learning about what you do at Moses Singer and what does your work entail there as a partner or senior partner for the firm? We're very interested in that today. Um, so I lead the private investment funds practice and I do capital markets work. So I have been uh, a corporate lawyer, so it's all sorts of corporate work, representing companies and investment funds uh, from entity formation, fund formation, investment management, uh, corporate M&A, public securities offerings and exits. So I do all that and I've been doing this for 20 years. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's wow. Amazing. And, and how did you find securities law, which I am so interested in, or did it find you? <laughs> so it basically found me. So um, I used to be a math Olympiad. And so the securities law involves a lot of numbers. So when I graduated from law school, you know, you are offered uh, with opportunities to practice laws in different areas, litigation, um, trust in estate, tax, and all sorts of laws. And I was just really good at capital markets work. So that's how I ended up doing this investment funds and capital markets work. We love it. And for someone who's not familiar with the capital markets, could you just define what capital markets mean? Capital markets is basically um, when the company raises money, whether through, uh, so there are different types of instruments. So, um, but capital markets, you know, usually in the law practice uh, 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 perspective, it's corporate M&A, meaning when the investment funds make an investment in the company, then it's called the capital markets, it's called the private capital markets. And then you have a public com capital markets is when the company raises money in the public uh, market by issuing securities in the, in, the, in, pub in the public market. So that's including, you know, um, the IPOs, reverse mergers, follow uh, uh, issuing, issuance of securities, uh, that kind of stuff. So these, these are all uh, means capital markets. What wow. do you think are some of the uh, most successful um, negotiations or contracts you've put into place that you've really enjoyed working on? Oh, uh, this, it's, you know, I, I don't want to name names because right. I have so many clients over the years. I think what whenever, kind of projects, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so whenever, you know, there are, you know, with uh, the, my clients, some are fortune 500 companies, some are early stage companies, and I always make time and uh, energy for smaller companies. Um, so they're not, you know, they're not 10% of my work, but I always make sure that I, I do have some smaller companies. And when these companies grow and then they go public and become major companies, I feel so proud to be part of that team. So um, I have uh, companies who started, uh, you know, the three founders started. And when they first uh, saw me, engaged me, they didn't even have a physical office. So I would meet them at a Starbucks. Oh, but then three, three years later, they're already very big. And then five years later, or seven years later, they went public. So oh, it's wow. so amazing. Yeah. Oh, I and love I, that. I love that. So, so what is a corporation's life cycle? Because it sounds like you start at the very beginning and then get them to public. So, so what are the stages that you have to go through? And, and how do you personally get involved? But it is so important for founders and investors to know the corporate life cycle. So usually a company have five stages. 
So the first stage is an idea stage. Uh, this is because every single company starts with an idea of a founder, like the two of you had this idea. So, and then that idea based on the, the, the founder uses the, uh, his or her idea and comes up with a rough business plan, rough prototypes or product. And then they test it among the close family and friends and see whether they like it. So this is called the idea stage. And at this stage, the founders usually have their daytime job. So right, they do it exactly. on weekends. <laughs> yeah, we can recommend that. <laughs> so they do it on weekends and, you know, after work. And they often use their savings to fund this passion. And then if the feedback is good, so more friends and family are having very good feedback, then they take it into the proof of concept stage. So at this stage, they form an entity, a legal entity, and then they um, develop a little more sophisticated products and service. And so this is, uh, you, there's a term called the minimum viable product, MVP, and they test it among wider audience. And so this is when you start getting seed round investment. You need to go and get some funding. And then if the feedback is good, so say you have a new recipe of Indian rice dish, you want to test it among your Indian community or alums that from India, and then they're buying it at the price point that you set. And then it's working, then you go into the third stage. It's called um, building stage. So building stage, now you hire people, one person, two people, three people. And then at this stage, you quit your day job. And you quit your day job and you have a much bigger investment. And the investors themselves, investors know which stage you are in. So your, your business plan needs to reflect it. So in the build up, uh, building stage, your minimum viable product become more and more sophisticated. You have always improving the service or, or products or recipe or price point, the process always improving. And then when that is, it goes well, you go to the fourth stage called the scaling stage. So in the scaling stage, your focus is on the founder or founders or two or three founders. Their main focus is expansion of market share. So you want to sign up as many people as possible, as many customers as possible, as many, you know, the, you know, if you're Amazon, as many customers as possible online. So it's, it's called the scaling stage. And at this stage, you're not even profitable yet, but you know, you're highly attractive as you acquire more customers and subscribers and members. And then the last stage is maturity and exit stage. So at this time, you already have enough market share. Your competitors know you and attack you. That means you're already, already there. And now you focus on profitability. So, and then at this time, the founders need, need to decide whether they want to stay with the company for years and years and years, whether they want to take the company public or um, whether they want to sell the company. It's called a sell event and exit it. So it's called a maturity and exit stage. Very important to know where you are at. So that's, you know, I, I try to educate my client and help them uh, uh, with the legal issues. Oh, which I'm sure wow. they truly appreciate it. Yeah. So do you, have you seen, you know, recently we, we were watching a movie called Show Her the Money, and it was about that only 3% of VC capital goes to, 2% goes to <laughs> women. Um, do you see that changing at all in your world? You mean uh, whether the investors have this uh, focused uh, investment category for women. In women yeah. more. Do, yeah. you, do you see women getting more venture funding coming down the pike or is it just uh, going to be upstream forever? <laughs> I, think it's, uh, I think it's a challenge for women still. Uh, so unless some funds set aside a bit of a basket for female um, founded companies, I do think it's still a challenge for female founders to get funding. Do you, do you think, think it's the concept that women generally have or is it just overall, it's just a gender bias? 
Um, I think it's both. I think the uh, female founders are uh, less uh, aggressive. The, you, you do have to, you cannot be, you do have to kind of, uh, the projection wise, very robust. I, I do see the business plan by female founders tend to be more um, humble. Mm. So that's probably true. That's probably true. Yeah, yeah, humble because you know they they, they less um, grand, aggressive or macho aggressive or... and grand. You know, yeah, so the like, investors. <laughs> yeah, like like <laughs> a little lower to the ground in terms of financial expectations and sales, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you look at uh, uh -huh. data, though, the female right. founded companies tend to outperform. Yeah. So the, the critical moments in a cooperation is how do you get that funding so you do have the money to hire people, right? So the thing is, that's the critical time. So the getting the funding is very important. Well, let's talk about that. What financing tools should companies use at all the stages of the life cycle that you described? Okay, right. we're at the so, beginning. What do I need? Am I at the bank? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> card. Is, with your hands so out. It's so important because you don't want to, yeah. If you, <laughs> so you don't want to approach an investor and ask for money and when you're not ready to that, get that kind of money. So in the early stage, it's your savings and then it's friends and family. So the early stage, um, so first two stages, first one is the idea stage. And then second one is the proof of concept stage. And during this stage, the instruments that, that are often used um, are um, convertible note um, and a simple agreement for future equity. It's called a safe. So convertible note is basically a debt, but it's unlike bank debt where you need to put up a collateral and then they go through like 200 pages. I'm exaggerating for the okay. approval process. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just forever endless. The, your angel investors or your rich, you know, uncle or grandpa. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they are willing Everyone to should have that. <laughs> you know, or a college classmate who got rich, whoever. So you gonna you wanna issue a convertible note. So convertible note is a debt instrument. So you have a principal. So if it's a ten thousand dollars, you have a principal amount and then you have increased interest accruing on the principal amount and then you have a maturity date. So on the maturity date the holder of the note can either ask you to pay back or you, they can convert. There's a conversion uh, event you can set up in that agreement. They can convert the note into equity. So they usually want to convert it if the company does well and have next financing uh, event. So that's convertible note. And simple agreement for future equity. It's basically the same as convertible note, except there's no maturity date. So it's indefinite. And then there's no interest accruing, so mm -hmm. yes, it's only it has it. It is it's a you know at the conversion event it converts into equity. So and it it costs uh, not much uh, in terms of legal fees because the agreement is all formatted. There's only two types of a safe agreement. One is pre-money safe agreement, and the post-money safe agreement. So if you're an investor, you want post-money safe agreement. If you're a founder, you want pre-money safe agreement, it's which one is more friendly. So that's early stage. And then from the third and fourth stage, it's series A preferred. Um, it's called a preferred round. So this is when the institutional VC and PE funds invest in the company. And there's bridge loans, there's some other, you know, and then you can go to a public market by under regulation A Jobs Act. Um, so there are other uh, financing instruments you can tap into, especially if you're doing some kind of um, public benefit kind of cooperation. So your full profit by your public benefit cooperation uh, under the category. So you, it's a hybrid of non-for-profit and for-profit. Mm -hmm. Then you can definitely go to a public market and raise like up to 25 million, 50 million. Mm. And yes. in your experience, Ruth, 
-hmm. recently, what are some of the challenges companies are having in getting financing? There goes my video. Oof, go on. <laughs> so, so the so challenges, you know, since COVID, of course, many challenges. The the interest rate is very high, so mm -hmm. bank loans are very difficult to get, and the VCPEs are not really putting money in uh, without leverage. So, I mean, they do go to uh, private credit, but still for the founders and companies, getting money is tougher and tougher because of the high interest rate. In addition to that, this geopolitical uncertainties, uh, mainly with uh, Russia, China, and you know, some other areas. So it's putting a lot of uncertainties into the investor side, and then it trickles down to the corporate side in terms of getting money. Right. So it's not just the money, it's the supply chain too, right? <laughs> supply chain issue, yes. yeah. So, and yeah. then the real estate issue, the changing employee, uh, the feelings about how much they want to work. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an environment, it's, it's not a uh, traditional environment for many companies and founders. Do you think this is the way it's going to go or do you think it will shift back to how it used to be? Uh, I don't think it's going to shift back. Okay. I think the only thing we're hoping is for the Fed to uh, reduce the rate. So I think once that happens, it's going to get easier. I think geopolitical issues, it looks like it's it's not going to get Solve better. itself anytime yeah, soon. I, yeah. I think it's going to stay as it is or worse. Um, the tensions. Right. The next few years. Okay. Ooh, ooh. So what do you think then the trends are going to be in the VC and PE investments? You know, what, what are the strategies and the methods, the acquisitions of financing? Like, how do you see that world, which just funds so much, actually more VCs because private equity only wants you when you're profitable? <laughs> yeah. So it, the VC community, um, I, so I'm private funds, uh, you know, I, that's my main, you know, if the percentage of the, of the practice, that's the main. And then I do have a pr private public M&A as well. Um, in spite of all this, and then another challenge is the regulations are getting tougher and tougher under Biden. So um, the SEC and the regulatory agencies are coming down with so many new laws. Um, and so the compliance cost is getting higher and higher. So in spite of these obstacles, the investment fund industry is really active. So okay. it's always so busy. They come, so the private credit is really getting a lot of attraction. They're doing, doing very well. Um, so the, the demand is still there. Um, it is an investor's market though. So, um, the founders really need to, it's harder for founders or smaller businesses to get funding. However, the investment funds are actually really doing well. We come up with, uh, the industry is coming up with all sorts of new uh, ideas. So, uh, for example, one of the new ways for VCs to do it is to set up a platform company a platform company and then they roll up or buy in or invest in smaller targets feeding in the same category or strategy and then they combine them to raise the valuation of those combined portfolio and then they have very uh, flexible exit strategies so that's one thing that's uh, uh, very new and the they're very active uh, in doing that. Mm, that's very interesting. So mm -hmm. as you mentor, I'm sure you mentor uh, new lawyers coming into the firm and so forth. How do you um, see or what do you advise them to do um, as they're entering their careers? You know, the first thing I always tell my uh, junior associates lawyers is building character building character building because we're in service as we provide services so when these companies and founders come to us they're you know i i believe in i believe in god so i always believe these are sent by god to me <laughs> to the insurance 
interns or new associates, I'm telling them that when the clients walk in, these are the people that God sends to us to take care of them and help them. So always think of them like with that mindset and then see how I can, what is their goal? How I can help them reach what they're trying to reach. So it's the mindset. And then once you have a right mindset, then you have you can when the client asks questions, sometimes they ask the same questions like five, ten times. <laughs> a lot more be. patient. A lot more patient. And then, yeah. you know, and at the spare time we always have to, you know, the lawyers are required to study minimum twenty four uh, credit hours a year to continue to sharpen our uh, skill set. So when we do that, we really want to learn so that we really provide the clients with the best, the forefront te uh, legal techniques to serve their company. Oh, that's wow. wonderful. That's great. Yeah. That's wow. so nice. Th thank you. Can we come back to to the corporate environment? You know, I, sure. I'd love to find out a little bit more about when you're buying and selling private companies. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the um, terms and considerations someone should think about today if you're buying or selling a company? Well, that's a huge topic. Huh? So buying and selling, I mean, if the, I think sometimes, uh, I think recent phenomenon is uh, the management, you know, the, the technology companies have been rather active because they are getting investments. And then there is a mismatch between the technology management founders and then the equity investors. So the management or management founders often try to buy the non non-tech founders out. Mm -hmm. So it's called the management buyouts or management roll-up uh, M&A. So in the AI or some of the technology-based fintech uh, companies, these uh, activities are rather rapid. So the management, so if you have three founders, you know, two, one is more like the technology person, whether it's some, somebody like Elon Musk or Sam Altman, and then you have other investors, and then there's a breakup happening. Uh, once the company goes a little bigger, the build up stage or scaling stage, there's breakup happening. And then this tech, but then leverage uh, the tech founders, they want to get rid of the, the original uh, investors and they want to have a new investors who's going to align with their dreams. And that happens. And, it, you know, uh, many times and it's a little acrimonious and we, I advise clients in the process. And so, Sometimes the board itself have a breakup. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so it is a tumultuous uh, time. And, and then this AI is bringing new challenge. Um, many firms have this AI technology and want to make sure they, they are ahead of this curve. Right. Yeah, so um, with the document management, time management. So a lot of people are getting laid off. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, 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 a lot of new op and a lot of opportunities, but what I'm Please hearing you it. saying with the AI companies is you got to get in front, kind of like Zoom got in front, right? In terms yeah. of being the platform. So you're saying whoever's in front is really going to be the, the, well, the one COVID that changes really helps it. Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, what yeah. a great fluke, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> or they could say a good timing you know, on the market, right? Yeah. So. Anyways, but Ruth, where can folks find you? How can folks find you if yes, um, yes. and your and, firm? What's the where, best way? And, and where do you practice? Uh, is it New York City yeah, only? Is it national? In, yeah, we're based in New York and we are uh, the New York member of the MSI. So we have global reach of practically every country. So, but I'm based in New York and people can find me on LinkedIn. There's contact information on the website. Yeah, yeah. It's easy to find me. Hey, great. Ter terrific. Well, thank you, Ruth Jin, who, and let's say your title again, the leader of investment funds and practice at Moses and Singer LLP. Thank you for being here with us today. And thank you to our listeners. Yes. Thank you also to our sponsors, City National Bank, Uncle Nearest, a female owned spirits company who we love, Nutanix, cloud service provider, Interpublic Group, Advertising Media and PR Companies, and Amplified Professional Services, Executive Search and IT Consulting. Thank you for listening and hit your subscribe button on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts today. Leave us a review, of course, five stars. Uh, follow us on social media and send an email to myself if you have any questions, Beth at 
csweet.org and check out our website www.csweet.org and yes, thank you ruth you're such a special value to us so thank you so much for thank being you part ruth of we C appreciate C-Suite. all you do at c-suite we should mention as we're ending that ruth is on our new york committee and an advisor to c-suite on the national level and we just so appreciate you ruth thank you it's my pleasure